Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lee Frame, the Associate Director of the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our inaugural talk in our Women's Wellbeing Lecture Series, which is funded by the Rosemary Toffolo Bowes Women's Mental Health Fund. So thank you, Dr. Bowes. The goal of the RNW Center's Women's Wellbeing Initiatives are to promote resilience and well-being, emphasizing mental health and wellness amongst the GW medical enterprise, and to educate providers on strategies that can be translated to patient care related to women's well-being. To kick off this new lecture series, we are thrilled to welcome an alum, Lara Williams, MD. Dr. Williams is the managing partner of an all-women's obstetrics and gynecology practice in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Williams and her team of female physicians work collaboratively with their patients to better serve their physical and emotional health using a culturally sensitive and integrative approach. Dr. Williams earned her medical degree from Texas A&M University and completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of New Mexico. She has proven herself to be a lifelong learner with post-professional certifications in, and this is gonna be a long list, so hold on to your hats, pain management, homeopathy, anti-aging medicine, functional medicine, herbal medicine, and medical acupuncture. Seven different post-professional certificates, very impressive. And then on top of that, right here at the George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences, she earned a master's of science in health science and integrative medicine in 2019. So it is our absolute pleasure to welcome back Dr. Lara Williams and to have her kick off this very important lecture series. Welcome, Lara. Good morning. Um, well, it's a little earlier in my time, so I'm like, good afternoon. I'm like, oh, that's right, East Coast. So it's morning here. <laughs> the sun is just coming up and the, hot, the, the fog is just clearing. So I'm going to do just a, there's gonna hopefully be something in here for everyone. Uh, what I wanted to do is look at the cascade of hormones through our lifetime. So we're gonna start with some basics and fundamentals just to kind of bring people into, I always think it's great to start at the beginning. This is kind of a, what happens in a 28 day cycle. So day, it shows you where your temperature is, where the hormone spikes are, what's happening with ovulation and what's happening with your uterus. Typically, this takes 28 days. Um, on a, it's not uncommon to see it between 26 and 35 days. Um, first day of bleeding is always day one. People, when especially when trying for fertility, you're always trying to figure out what's day one. Day one is the first day of bleeding. The first part of the cycle, the follicular phase, is estrogen dominant. The second part of the phase, it, the luteal phase, is progesterone dominant. This cascade of hormones is gonna be important, especially as we start looking at perimenopause and menopause, because a lot of the things that start to happen, we see then. Typically, ovulation is day 14 if you have a 28-day cycle. If you have a 26-day cycle, you may ovulate on day 11 or 12. It's really important that follicular phase can be a little shorter, that luteal phase has to be 14 days to be successful and have a successful phase. Um, typically, the fertile window is five days before ovulation and starting 24 days, uh, 24 hours after ovulation. Sometimes it's, it's bigger. I've seen it as long as seven days on either side. Um, sperm can live. So let's talk. So oh, this slide didn't go so well when it enlarged. Um, so this is kind of going to what happens with ovulation. Um, I always tell people ovulation, they did this really great video where they put a camera in a woman's body and filmed ovulation. It literally looks like a cannonball being exploded through a wall. So with the cannonball being exploded through the wall, they call that metal schmerz. I call it, oh my God, that really hurts. Um, because all of the people, that's what you feel. You feel this awful pain in some cases, not everyone. I found that the more birthdays I accumulated, the more uncomfortable that got. And part of it is our bodies are still, as we're winding down, trying to really kick out that best egg, but that's kind of what's happening. It's an explosion. And sometimes that explosion has blood um, behind it. And so that happens. So when, when you go, when these people go to the emergency room and the emergency room says, oh, you have a cyst. My answer is, yep, you get one of those every month. You're supposed to. So that's what happens. You'll see a body basal temperature spike. And that's kind of what's happening during that process. Okay. Things that need investigation in a normal menstrual cycle. Um, bleeding with intercourse, spotting that occurs before or after your period or in the middle, um, cycles that are less than 26 days or greater than 35 days, or cycles that are irregular, because this can lead us to other things that we need to be thinking about. Okay, 
what impacts fertility? So the first part of this is we're going to talk about, you know, women who are still in their fertile years and kind of figuring out what happens with them. So tobacco smoking, we don't give it enough credit as to how harmful that it is to fertility, both male and female. Alcohol. Alcohol is one of those things that I tell people to start winding down if they're planning on pregnancy. Um, marijuana, it's legal here. And I have seen a massive reduction in fertility, especially in men with marijuana. So it's one of the big things that I always have. Also marijuana in women accumulates in the fat tissues. And so when you are pregnant and you are detoxifying your body, you're detoxifying to your fetus. So um, all other drugs need to stop. And then caffeine, it's limiting between eight and 16 ounces, which is a 300 milligram equivalent. So it's not that you have to give up that favorite cup of coffee, just reduce down from those four cups. Okay, what do you need if you're trying for pregnancy? You need to be on a prenatal vitamin with at least 800 micrograms of folic acid. I prefer methylated folate. 75% of people have a methyl defect. And so they, they are unable to take folic acid from its, it, from its folic acid form to the, the bioavailable methylfolic acid form. So I always like to have a vitamin with that in it. Um, fish oil, vegetarian and vegans, you can take a DHEA, EPA combo, but there's a debate on whether this is necessary. Part of the, a lot of the literature is somebody went out and bought something off the shelf at, you know, one of the chains, not actually high quality supplements or fish oil. Like that's the problem with a lot of the studies where they're saying, oh, that's, that's not useful or whatever. Um, it is because they didn't study really good products. Um, vitamin D, I like to see those levels around 60. The fertility literature says that there's a big difference in women whose vitamin D levels are below 30. So IVF doctors are constantly trying to get it above 30, but they tend to stop at 30. Um, I got into an argument with one just the other day because they want my patient to stop her vitamin D even though her level is 50. And my answer is no, I'm happy. I want her between 50 and 60. So um, iron for sure. Like I find that most, most individuals with a uterus, um, if they still bleed, have problems holding on to iron. It, and with how much celiac we're seeing, how much autoimmune, how much um, SIBO, this is a bigger issue than we gave it credit for. Some people need that B complex. Um, I find a lot of low B levels, um, especially in people who have that methylation defect. What should I avoid when I'm trying for pregnancy? Well, the obvious, lead. So around here, we have a lot of houses that are old that had lead paint, but we actually, one of the biggest sources um, a lot of times is in the water. Um, so it's filtered water and it doesn't have to be fancy. A Brita filter will work. Like it, it's not this fancy $4,000 system. You can literally put one on your counter. Um, arsenic, uh, it's found in a lot of rice products. So it's really important to watch that pesticides, particularly Roundup, and then cleaning up cat feces. And in our community, it's more of the outdoor gardens because a lot of the outdoor cats poop in the gardens. And so the people think, oh, I don't have an outdoor cat, I'm fine, but it's actually their garden that's their risk factor. Exercise, is it okay? Yes, but what I tell people is I don't want you to do a lot of core workouts. Um, I need that abdominal wall to open and elongate. And if you're constantly crunching it, you will split those muscles. I see a lot of runners do that because they're not elongating out of their torso to make space for that baby. Um, it is, and I always tell people, you want to be able to carry on an easy conversation and we don't want to be over-exercising. So over-exercising has major impacts on both the menstrual cycle and fertility. Um, and so it's really important to be thinking about, am I exercising too much? You know, my patients that are running 50 and 60 miles a week, that's one thing if you're keeping up with the nutri nut nutrition to be able to do that. But if you're running 50 or 60 miles a week, um, trying to get pregnant, that requires a lot of nutrition intake to keep up. Okay, foods to eat. I love the simple, easy, clean 15, dirty dozen. It's a really easy way to like, there's plenty of apps that you can kind of look at and, and know what's on the list. Um, eight to 10 servings of uh, vegetables a day. I, I'm, I love when people get that much. It gives you the nutrients plus the fiber. Um, you need to be really careful because you can have a organic farm and have a non-organic farm miles apart. The pesticides can come across 
and take your organic foods and now it has pesticides on it. Something as simple as Dawn dish soap helps take that off. Um, you wanna limit your fruit servings to less than two per day, especially if you have blood sugar issues. And with fruits, I always tell people, go for the real beautiful colors. We don't eat enough of those dark purple foods. And so blackberries and blueberries have those really rich antioxidants. Um, ideally try for organic meat, poultry and fish, ideally wild. Um, the fish recommendations around pregnancy are much higher than they were, thank goodness, because I thought they were a little short before. But it's really important that when you're, look, when you're looking at what fish you're eating, um, to figure out what mercury content, because some fish have higher mercury and you don't want to be having that as much when you're pregnant, even if you're not pregnant, especially with people with heart disease. Um, if you don't eat dairy, make sure you're replacing it with calcium-rich foods. And you really need to figure out, am I getting enough? Because a lot of my vegetarians really aren't because they're not a huge sardine fan. <laughs> the sardines are a great way to get calcium. Medical conditions that affect menstrual cycle. So I've got over-exercising on here. We, we touched on that a little bit ago. It is really important to have balance too much stress. Um, if you look at um, women going into finals, um, if you look at going into finals, the number of them that will miss a period, have an irregular period, you know, have a period because of stress. Stress plays a big role. Blood sugar, 100% an issue. Thyroid, I see that all the time. Thyroid is one of the most underdiagnosed conditions in women. Blood sugar, one third out of all Americans will become diabetic um, or is diabetic, okay? polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can lead to blood sugar issues, and endometriosis. I find endometriosis is not as much of a menstrual cycle disruptor as it is a fertility disruptor. Okay, let's talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome because I find that this often is missed as well. You need two out of three criteria. You need to have an irregular period, multiple immature follicles seen on ultrasound, also known as the string of pearl sign, or an elevated testosterone by blood or by symptoms. You do not have to have all three. And I see that happen a lot where somebody's got two out of the three and somebody's like, oh, but you don't have it. And the answer is you just need two. Okay, why does PCOS matter? Well, it causes irregular periods. A lot of people will have abnormal hair growth, acne. It can cause infertility or low fertility. It can lead to endometrial cancer or hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is a step below cancer. And then the big ones that you're going to battle for the rest of your life is the insulin issues, insulin resistance, which eventually can turn into metabolic syndrome. What is insulin resistance? So I think of insulin and glucose like a key in a lock. So insulin is the key that inserts into the cell, turns the lock, and it allows glucose to come into that cell. If it can't do that, then glucose uh, saturates the tissues. The, and then a lot of times what'll happen is that insulin will continue to go up trying to basically take a sledgehammer to that lock. So instead of gently inserting a key because everything's balanced, it's now taking a sledgehammer to the door trying to get the door to open. So when those insulin starts, insulin is a precursor to developing diabetes. So if we're starting to already see insulin resistance but sugar levels are normal, diabetes will come. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Okay, so I love this. This is really talking about where insulin, we start to see rises as, the, as we're starting to see prediabetes. Like that's one of the first things that mark. It also increases our risk of heart disease. One of the reasons I spend so much time here today talking about blood sugar is, again, it's going to affect one out of every three people who is on this conversation or people in your lives. So you have to think one in three is a large proportion of people, okay? So, and as we have more insulin resistance, heart disease, which is the number one killer in women. We don't give heart disease enough um, playtime. We talk about breast cancer. We talk about bones, both very important but heart disease really takes us out as women. Okay, metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is the next stage. So insulin resistance, you just got some insulin. Now you're moving into a different category. So now we have elevated blood pressures. Now we're gaining weight around that middle section. We're starting to elevate our cholesterol and then we're developing diabetes. And so, and I don't know about you guys, I don't want any of these. Like these are things on my list of things not to do when I wake up in the morning. 
Okay. So what are four steps that we can do to balance blood sugar and insulin levels? We can determine what our risk is. If you're somebody who's really not at risk, this doesn't apply to you. Move on to the things that do apply to you. Um, if, if it does, you need to know what your blood sugar and your insulin level are. A lot of primary care providers just get a fasting glucose or they get a um, hemoglobin A1C, which is your average over three months. I'm not seeing as many um, in the traditional settings getting insulin. I get insulin on everybody. Um, you want to know what your weight is and you want to know what your cholesterol panel looks like. You want to then come up with what lifestyle changes. Like that's the big key. Lifestyle has the largest impact on blood sugar. It's not pop a pill. It is how do we move our bodies and eat foods that support us. And then we want to make sure we're being successful. Okay. So step one is to determine your risk. You can, you can calculate something with getting blood work called an insulin resistance score. You need your fasting glucose and your fasting insulin to do this. And then you can look at what your diet looks like, questionnaire. This is where I find nutritionists are amazing or, and dietitians at helping really hone this in. It's, it's figuring out, well, this food and this food have the same caloric value, but are they the same to your blood sugar? And the answer in a lot of cases is no. And we'll get to that in a minute. You want to set targets. You want to know what you want to reduce, but it's not just weight. It's what, what kind of fat do you want to lose? What's your waist circumference? Because that's our risk for heart disease is what that measurement band around our waist is. You want to know what your blood sugar is, that hemoglobin A1C that I was talking about, that three months of blood sugar results, what your fasting insulin is, and what your insulin resistance score is. And that's a combination. Your insulin resistance is looking at what your glucose to your insulin are. You want to figure out how to reduce, and this is that low glycemic impact. Remember when I said that some foods are, are, have more issues than others? That's that low glycemic. That's that glycemic index. We want to eat fiber. We need 25 grams a day as women. And if you calculate how much fiber you get, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Like most of us are getting between five and 10, unless you have a predominantly plant-based diet. We just don't get enough. You want to make sure that you're eating, not eating so that you're popping full. Like sometimes it's eating smaller more often than it is, you know, you don't want to be needing to be rolled out of the restaurant. Um, you want to eat breakfast. This is the big, big, if I can make one thing, my patients with blood sugar issues skip breakfast. 100% of the time they skip breakfast. They're, they wake up. Their brain, their sugars are up because of their blood sugars are up overnight because fasting, you release glycogen from your liver. So they wake up, their blood sugars are up. Their body says, I'm fine. So they skip breakfast. They're not hungry. A lot of times it, breakfast makes them feel gross. And so they just, they don't eat until lunch. But now we've pushed um, calories back because, and sometimes they don't eat until two. And so now they're getting hungrier and by dinner, they're starving. Um, eliminate soda and sugary beverages. I've had, I had one patient lose 25 pounds just dropping Pepsi from her diet. That's all she did. She pulled Pepsi out 25 pounds later. She was like, that's all I did. <laughs> she called it the Pepsi free diet, 25 pounds. And then those artificial sweeteners that a lot of us are using to supplement, they have some bigger issues because they trick our brain. Um, and I'm going to get to that in a second. So here's the, the here's glycemic index. So glycemic index shows that two foods, these two potato foods, are not the same. That Idaho potato, which tastes delicious, is sitting at the high glycemic index. Sweet potato is sitting at the low glycemic index. So you can see why so many foods are substituting Idaho potatoes for sweet potatoes because that sweet potato's got you know the lower glycemic index. It's just like for morning. Which one would you rather do, the steel cut oats or the cornflakes? Those steel cut oats are gonna be with you a little bit longer. So it just kind of gives you where you've got two family foods, you know, both breakfast or um, a vegetable, but they're in very different categories. So if you have to um, count your glycemic index, so, okay, so you eat a high glycemic food, your blood glucose levels spike, okay? Well, then they crash, but they tend to crash down. You get that hunger spike where you're like, oh my gosh, I have got to put whatever in my mouth or I'm, I'm craving. And it's never, you're never craving broccoli. Let's be honest. We're never craving broccoli. We're craving something that is not broccoli. So 
that that craving then ends up typically reaching for another high glycemic index food because we want it quick. We need it quick because now our blood sugars are dipping. And so then you, you eat another high glycemic food and now you're up. The more the, and this is where the heart disease thing comes in, because as we have blood sugar issues, we have inflammation, we, we have fatty disease, like people who have blood sugar issues. One of the things that I'll often start seeing on their ultrasound is that they're having, um, they'll, they'll call it steatosis, but that is that we are having too much blood sugar. Okay. So here's that again, not reaching for that broccoli. We're reaching for you know, the bar on our desk, you know, the, you know, the candy machine, a soda, soda is often where we're doing. And so we end up keep upping and down because our liver is trying to save us by releasing glucose, but we're not helping ourselves. Okay. Remember I said we were going to get to the artificial sweeteners. They are not better. So artificial sweeteners have been linked to a lot of disease processes. Okay. So even if you ignore that, even if you say, I don't believe that, the problem is they confuse the body's natural digestive processes. So your body has this sweet. So a lot of times you overeat, you start storing excess calories and you get food cravings and it also contributes to metabolic disease. So even if you want to ignore all the other stuff, oh, I'm not eating aspartame, I'm having, you know, something else. The problem is, is it confuses the body. Okay, so we're on step three on how we reduce blood sugar stuff. Um, ideally you want 150 minutes per week. So originally things were, the reason that we have this 30 minute, um, or even 10 minute increments is because that's where they, that's as much as they could measure. They could measure 10 minutes. Okay. Does that mean if you take the stairs instead of the elevator that you don't get to count that towards your minutes per week? Absolutely not. Those totally count as minutes. If you park your car further away at the grocery store and you walk, count those minutes, those all count. Part of the problem is we don't have the ability to quantify. And so when we don't have the ability to quantify, we make these statements like you have to. And so everyone thinks I have to get to the gym. And if I can't get to the gym, I'm a big fat failure. And what's the point? And the answer is you don't have to get to the gym. You need to move your body. The blue zone taught us that. The blue zone data is looking at the largest groups of centenarians. And were they doing CrossFit and doing Orange Theory? Most certainly they were not. They were riding their bikes. They were walking to the grocery store. They were parking their car in one place and going to three separate shops without moving their car. So, um, and again, in the South, man, I would, I'm moving my car. It's too hot. Um, I grew up in Texas. There was no walk in between stores um, unless I was taking a shower in between. So again, you have to do it where you can. Um, it's also managing stress and getting sleep. If I can tell you as somebody who's taken call for 20 plus years, when I'm tired, I eat worse. I crave, I am 100% not eating broccoli. I'm craving things that bring up my blood sugar because I'm tired. If you're stressed, we're looking for that comfort. Again, it's not broccoli. Um, you want to track your progress. This is why a lot of the apps like... Um, my fitness pal and um, Noom do so well. It's just accountability. It is writing down what you're doing and taking the win. Because a lot of times there are a lot of wins and we don't take them. I find having taken care of women for my entire professional career, we are our own worst critics. We don't take the wins where we need to take the wins. And there are so many wins on a daily basis. We all are so successful on such a daily basis and we need to take the wins. In these apps, a lot of times you can see the win. You can see like, wow, I, you know, I got a lot of stuff. I didn't realize I'd walked that much today. So take the wins. Okay, let's talk about stress. If, if the last three years have taught us nothing, it is stress has an impact. So typically we consider stress, oh, I'm so stressed out. Like that's the term we all know, but it's not like I'm so stressed out. It's a non-specific response of the body for any demand for change, okay? So any demand, that can be going from um, 50 degree weather swings in one day. That can, be, um, that can be not getting some sleep. That can be, um, you do a major um, sugar detox, like, 
yes, those are all good. Some of those are good things for you, but that's going to be a, any demand for change. So it doesn't have to be mental stress. It can also be physical stress. And I think I've had people be like, oh, I'm not stressed. And I'm like, I get that. Like, I love stress. Like I am a, I thrive on that. That doesn't necessarily, and so, and a lot of us are like that. Like that's what's driven me forward is I, I couldn't have accomplished what I accomplished without enjoying a little bit of that. Um, but I also have to make the, the counter uh, things that I need to do in order to be able to do what it affects my body and how it affects my body. Okay, the simple, the simple definition for this is when your body has to respond to a demand for change. And again, we talked about all kinds of things that that can be demand for change. Um, and some people it's, you know, the weather has a huge impact and we don't take that into consideration. Okay, let's talk about our adrenals. Our adrenals are these tiny little glands, not in our brain. They are behind our kidneys. They are involved in making lots of these wonderful little hormones that nobody talks about. Because in traditional medicine, we only talk about them when they are really out of whack, way high or way low. And for the rest of the time, we just kind of ignore them. Um, in the integrative functional medicine world, we start focusing on them a lot, lot more because in, in hormones, which is a lot of what I do, if I don't fix somebody's adrenals, I am not fixing their hormones. And a lot of times their hormones are off because their adrenals are off. Um, because is it more important to reproduce or to live? Your body is not stupid. It is going to pick live over reproduction. So sex hormones fall down onto the um, cascade. And so if we're not taking care of our adrenals, then our sex hormones become less of an issue. Okay, let's talk about the three stress response stages in this general adaptation syndrome. The first, and, and most of us know what these feel like. We've lived there. Some of us have lived in the third stage. I have actually been in the third stage more than once. Again, that's that whole, I like stress. And when I'm not taking care of my body, it has its own opinions. So the alarm stage, like that's important. That's that zebra gazing, you know, grazing in the savanna, the lion charges after them, that zebra takes off and then it returns because the lion's gone, it's escaped, it's fine, it's now grazing again. So it goes up and it comes right back down to where it was. Some of us get stuck in this phase. This, and then the second phase is the resistance stage and the third phase is the exhaustion stage. And I'm gonna talk about those a little bit more. Okay. The alarm stage, we tend to be, it's high cortisol levels. Why? Because we need to be outrunning our enemies. So you'll feel high strung, anxiety, insomnia. Sometimes your immune system compromises. We start getting weight around our middle. Like when a lot of people will be like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden I just got this pooch. So yep, that can be, that does, there are lots of things that can cause that, but stress is one of them. It puts, it starts making us have insulin resistance. We start skipping our periods. We start getting blood pressure issues because all of that cortisol is having uh, an impact here. Okay, the resistance stage. This is, I call it the tired and wired. So like you are really, really tired, but you're like, you're not getting, you're, you're having all of these other things. This is where we really start seeing some blood sugar imbalances. People will just feel like their energy is crashing. Like, that three o'clock in the afternoon, you've now adapted and have a, you know, a high energy drink at that. Your weight's going all over the place. Sex doesn't sound like such a great idea. Like you're just like, I just, I'm not interested in anything. You start getting more food, caffeine cravings. You wake up not feeling um, rested and you're having sleeplessness at night and just don't feel like you can make it through things that you used to be able to make it through. The exhaustion stage is the most dangerous stage. So they've done data that if, if you are in the exhaustion stage and you're in a car accident or you have a heart attack, you are less likely to recover. So if you, that, so does that matter? Yeah, you don't wanna be in this stage. So this tends to be low cortisol. So you can't make that spike. You can't mount that fight or flight that protects us. That's what protects us if you're in a car accident um, or if you know you have a heart attack. So where we really start seeing here is, you know, immune suppression, you know, lethargy, just like you just can't get out. Like there's nothing, you're having all the caffeine in the world and you're still not enough. We're continuing to see all the stuff we were seeing 
before, but now we've got decreased motivation. We're really not sleeping. We're having way, you know, issues, but we're also starting in, in women having cycle issues. Those will start appearing um, in the resistance stage as well. But it, this is just a lot of people, you know, the way I described it is my brain just felt like I was in water. Like every task took so much more to get through to it. And my brain functions a lot faster than that. And so when I was in stage three, that was the big thing I noticed. Like, yeah, and, and decreased motivation. I, I don't have any trouble getting motivated. So when that starts going on, like these are your cues. Okay. We're starting to, so we've kind of addressed, you know, stress. We've kind of talked about blood sugar. Now we're going to talk about some of the different things that we see in menstrual cycles before we come into um, perimenopause and menopause. PMS. Okay. So we've all been told or heard when we were younger, oh, she's just, it's just her time of the month. She's just acting like that. PMS is <laughs> more than your time of the month. Like it has physical and emotional symptoms with it. Um, and they can range from the typical bloating, um, breast tenderness, but you can also have hot flashes. And then you've got all the mood stuff, the irritability, the depressed mood, food cravings, um, all of that kind of stuff. And it, it matters. Like there are things that we can do about it. So what, are, what can we do? That's, it's all of the stuff that we do for physical well-being. It's exercise. A lot of women know, like if they're exercising and they've done data on this, if they're exercising, they feel better. Diet, you really have to watch the things that you crave when you have PMS, which is the salty foods, the caffeine, the sugar, the simple carbohydrates. Like those will make you may feel better in the moment, will make you, you'll lose, you may win the battle, but you're gonna lose the war. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, they can help with the, the discomforts like the cramping and the headaches relaxation. Like we don't do enough things to relax ourselves, um, reducing stress, deep breathing, yoga, those kinds of things. And then supplementing vitamin D is really important, especially in places like where I live, where from uh, October to March, you can't get enough vitamin D. It's just absolutely impossible. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I, the, the literature quotes this is about 5%. I feel like I see it more. I really start seeing this in, in 35 and above. Um, these are people who've typically had PMS, but they've been able to manage it, and now they can't. Um, you have to have five or more of symptoms. Um, it is actually classified as a mental health illness, um, and it has to impact family, relationships, work, and all my patients who have PMDD know that it is impacting. Like I have one patient who was like, I don't pick up my kids from school because I'm going to take out somebody in the pickup line. Like she knows it. It's like she gets this rage and she's like, I'm going to run somebody over. So my husband picks them up during certain times of the month. And I was like, okay, that's an actual thing that's interfering with your life. Let's figure out what we need to do. So these are the, um, the, these are the criteria. So if you have five or more, it doesn't have to be in one category or the other. But if you have five or more of these symptoms, then you meet the criteria. And the number of people who come to see me who meet this criteria, I'm finding feels like it's greater than 5%. Okay, let's talk about perimenopause. So perimenopause is that transitional time that happens around menopause. And it can, it can incorporate the menstrual cycle and it has physical and emotional changes. It can last two to 10 years. This is actually true. Two to 10 years I am seeing, and I have some people that last more like 15. So, um, all right, let's talk about the phases. There are five phases in this. Phase A, you tend to get shorter cycles. You're starting to lose that follicular phase. You're still ovulating on day 11, 12, 13, but that follicular phase is, sh is shortening. We're starting to get more PMS symptoms, headaches and migraines, and we're starting to maybe have some hot flashes before the menstrual flow starts. Phase B, this is where I start seeing some flooding. So these are the folks that are coming in now that their periods are so heavy, they're flooding through everything. They are so, they so need something um, here to help with how much bleeding they're having. We're starting to have some hot flashes during uh, and at the end of sleep, and we're having more PMS. Phase C, now we're starting to get some irregular um, cycles. Sometimes they're heavy, sometimes they're light. 
PMS is like some months are fine, some months are not. Um, and now maybe we're having some daytime hot flashes. Uh, phase D, now we're starting to space out our periods. Sometimes we're having spotting. It's no big deal. Sometimes we're flooding. We have no idea what that's what month that's going to be. Hot flashes are pretty erratic. And PMS symptoms seem to be like all month long. Like it's I'm I'm irritable. I'm 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 frustrated. Um, I'm arguing with my partner, those kinds of things. Uh, final phase, which typically lasts a year, but I have a lot of people who go 362 days and then get a period. And I had one who did that several years in a row. So it's typically a year, it's no period. Sometimes you feel like you're gonna get a period, you get all the symptoms, you get the breast tenderness, you get the cramps, no period. And now we're starting to see more frequent hot flashes. Okay, the definition of menopause without surgery is the absence of a period for one year. Or if both ovaries were removed, that's surgical menopause. So we have, um, and then you can have medical menopause, which can be from chemotherapy uh, and other agents. Okay, symptoms of menopause. And these can also exist in the perimenopausal phase. That's why it's so hard. I spend a lot of time in this, in this realm because I find that if you look at the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, it says to treat women based on symptoms. I put a little asterisk by that and say, after you've checked their labs, because high estrogen and low estrogen feel similar. I've seen them have hot flashes and night sweats. The vaginal dryness tends to be more consistent with low estrogen. My high estrogen patients, sometimes they're, caught, they're having vaginal irritation because they're getting more bacterial infections or yeast, but they don't have the dryness. My low estrogen patients, that's usually how I can differentiate. We're having decreased libido, poor memory, insomnia, weight gain, and irritability. And that irritability is, you know, it affects things. Like it's just, you don't feel comfortable in your own skin. Um, the, the symptoms are thought to be because of fluctuations in hormones. They're thought to be worse at night because of low estrogen um, and increase in adrenaline. So that you get these hot flashes at night. I wanna put a little asterisk here in my clinical practice. Night sweats, the majority of time, are not due to hormones. They are due to blood sugar, a little too much wine before dinner or before bed, and um, stress. So it is, if somebody's coming to me and they're like, I have these terrible hot flashes and or night sweats and nothing is fixing them, I don't fix them with hormones. I fix them by addressing their stress levels and by looking at what they're having before bed. Are we getting enough protein? Do we have enough fat to make it through the night? Um, also caffeine, alcohol, blood sugar, thyroid can all give symptoms too. So it's really important, you, even though it quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, it could be a sparrow. And so I always check thyroid in these cases too, because thyroid is the great mimicker. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, low estrogen. So let's talk about the, we're going to start going through the hormonal cascade that happens as we wind down. So the predominant hormone that we lose during menopause is estrogen. And so that gives us the hot flashes. It sometimes will give us the night sweats, um, insomnia, vaginal dryness, for sure. They did a really nice study um, in 2013 and said that a lot of women's vaginal dryness symptoms won't appear till seven years past menopause. So if pains, you're starting to have pain with intercourse and, and you're like, what, what is going, what's new? What, what's changed? The answer is it may not appear till seven years. They also showed that women who take systemic hormones and you're thinking, oh gosh, I've got everything covered. The vagina sometimes needs something else. So vaginal hormones is often needed in menopause to help with the vaginal symptoms. The vagina is not covered in systemic hormones like we originally thought. So if you're not reading about vulvar stuff, like I read a lot, um, vulvar dermatology is one of my loves. Um, I kind of learned this you know, th not through my original training, but by keeping up. Um, we start seeing mood changes, irritability, and a lot of times bladder symptoms uh, initiate. So this is why a lot of urologists and urogynecologists will give women vaginal estrogen and their bladder symptoms improve. Causes of natural, uh, causes of low estrogen, being severely underweight. We need a certain amount of fat to make hormones. Um, excessive exercise. Again, we're not having enough fat. Thyroid conditions, we talked about natural menopause, which is just the number of birthdays we've had versus surgical, and then chemotherapy. 
There are lots of ways that you can get estrogen. There are ones that you can uh, pick up at a pharmacy, whether it's compounded or um, a traditional pharmacy. And then there are foods that contain estrogen um, and can help us have balanced estrogen. Um, the soy, but it's gotta be non-GMO. A lot of it is just way over-processed. Flaxseed, that's one of my favorite um, ones, especially in my younger population that's involved in something called seed cycling, where I actually try to bring, bring people's menstrual cycle back around using flax and sesame seeds or pumpkin um, and sunflower seeds. And cruciferous vegetables. We really, as women, can't eat enough cruciferous vegetables. It helps us process our estrogens better. Um, other supplements that can help raise estrogen, um, red clover, black cohosh, evening primrose oil, chase tree berry, and dong quai. And there's a lot of preparations that have one or more of these in them. Low progesterone. So we start seeing this, I see this a lot in the perimenopausal um, symptoms. And so as we're starting to head toward menopause, a lot of the symptoms we're having are due to low progesterone, anxiety, depression, insomnia, irritability. Causes of low progesterone. Um, again, we're seeing our, our you know, good friend menopause, but also stress antidepressants, thyroid issues, saturated fats, sugar, and vitamin deficiencies. So, and again, that this, these low progesterone symptoms can, can plague us even in our younger years. Um, do you need to take progesterone? In the menopausal journey, if you have a uterus, you must be on some form of progesterone. Um, you have to take it in order to protect the uterus. Um, there are synthetics and then there are natural formulations and the natural formulations can be purchased, you know, progesterone exists at Walgreens. Uh, thank goodness they have, you know, cause when I started practicing 20 years ago, it was basically a fertility only med and you could not get it for menopausal women. And then there are synthetic progesterones. Functions of testosterone. Um, it can function as libido in women without ovaries. What we've seen is in the postmenopausal ovaries, um, they produce a fair amount of testosterone. So in studies where we've given women who still have their ovaries testosterone, it doesn't have the same impact as women without ovaries. Um, it can increase muscle mass and strength. It can decrease excess body fat, and it can have an increased um, sense of well-being. That being said, not all women need extra testosterone. Um, it's just one of those things that we stay on the radar. I've seen so many who are like, oh, it's, it's going to make my sex life better. And the answer is that hormone is still estrogen for uh, women. Signs of low testosterone, muscle wasting, weight gain, fatigue, low self-esteem. Causes, surgical menopause, like that's the big one. We take the ovaries out. Adrenal stress and burnout is right there with it and chemotherapy because again, chemotherapy is taking out the ovaries. Um, and it's not like the ovaries have had this slow wind down. They just got knocked down. How do we raise our testosterone? We can, we can give testosterone. We can make sure we're getting enough protein. Um, we can make sure that we're getting the right kind of calories, so not overeating. Um, we can balance our amino acids. We can sleep. We can reduce stress. And then one of my favorite, favorite things for women is HIT, high intensity interval training. The New York Times did an article on the eight minute workout and they make an app for it. It's eight minutes. It's, you could do it in a hotel room. You can do it in your office. It's eight minutes. And they basically said, we need to do it two to three times a week. Um, and it helps us build muscle. It's, it's incredible. And it, they, there are so many good apps that'll literally count you down, count you in. DHEA. So DHEA is a hormone that's made in the adrenal glands. Remember the glands behind our kidneys. It starts to decline in production starting in our 20s. And by 70, we're only making one fourth of what we were making earlier. It also is a pro-hormone that can help us make estrogen and testosterone down the road. DHEA helps increase our sense of well-being. We, we manage stress with it. It can support the immune system. It helps repair and maintain tissue. Um, and there's some, one formulation that you can actually use in the vagina. There are several to help improve vaginal tissues. That being said, please do not go out and just buy 25 milligrams of DHEA. I find that women in my practice who are buying something online to help themselves feel better buy DHEA. Yes, it can help you have a sense of well-being, but because it's a pro-hormone, it can affect your hormones downstream, your estrogen, your testosterone. So don't just go out and 25 is more of a male dose. I don't have many women past 10 milligrams. 
So smoking can cause our DHA to drop down, having more birthdays, and then stress. All right, thyroid. Thyroid is the master regulator and can mimic everything. So I always check that if I've got somebody in menopause because I want to make sure we don't miss it. Symptoms, you notice what we were talking about earlier with menopause, these look really similar. We've got the fatigue and the hot flashes and the night sweats and the weight gain and the dry skin. All of the same things we were seeing in menopause, we're also seeing in thyroid. Constipation is also another one. Okay, so how do we balance all of these things? So I'm going to give you my four things that if you were like, where do I start? These four is where you start. Okay. Diet. Many women self-medicate. And during COVID, the number of women alcoholics I have seen has, I, I literally have the help desk number underneath my computer is how often I'm having to use it. Because we are coping and we self-medicate during our, you know, I'm really seeing it in the 40s. It always oh, helps me sleep. It helps me manage stress. One glass became two bottles. Okay. Um, it also makes you have hot flashes. Um, those of us who are in our mid forties, um, can, uh, can understand where that comes. You have a glass of wine and you wake up at two o'clock in the morning. And you're like, what is wrong? Oh yeah. I had a glass of wine. Um, sugars can raise your insulin level, which turns into more body weight. You want to make sure you're getting plenty of vegetables. I cannot, I cannot push vegetables enough. Um, they are so not done in our world. Um, I, I ragged on broccoli, but man, broccoli has got so many amazing things. All the cruciferous vegetables, your Brussels sprouts, your cabbage, like who doesn't in the winter love a great cabbage soup? Um, there's all kinds of great things. You wanna get plenty of filtered water. Um, you need half of your body weight. If you were seeing me in my office, I have a 32 ounce jug that sits on my desk. I put fruit and vegetables in it to make it look pretty and to annoy me so that I will drink it all day long. Um, we want to eliminate and limit our caffeine because it really does cause problems with sleep. We wanna move our bodies. This does not mean go hit CrossFit or hit the, you know, do something crazy. It's Move your bodies, hit, we talked about, there's that um, seven minute workout. I said eight, but it's seven minute workout, I think. Maybe it's eight. I'll have to look that one up. I'm like, I'm now doubting myself. New York Times did a great article about it. There are amazing um, apps for it. Stress management. You gotta figure out what's the thing that you need. If you are not a meditator, I am not a meditator. Don't meditate. Um, one of my partners gets up every morning at five o'clock and she meditates for an hour and that is her, like that makes her better. One of my favorite, favorite things, these, this calm.com app has, I have so many people using it. Um, you can listen to Matthew McConaughey talk to you in your dreams. Um, so they, they have all these people, you know, recording these wind downs and these stories and a lot of my patients have found it very helpful. I also have to give a major plug to heart rate variability training. Um, heart rate variability training is amazing. Um, it really says that, you know, the concept is we have X number of heartbeats that we live in our life. And if we can actually get our resting heart rate down and, and have, have appropriate responses to stress and all of those things, then we have a longer longevity. Diaphragmatic breathing is um, also really helpful and can be done anywhere. You can be sitting in a traffic light, you can be in the grocery store. Um, and then other things I do gyrotonics. Nobody's probably ever heard of that. Um, I fell in love with that about 17 years ago and, um, it, it's changed my world. Like I've probably kept myself from multiple surgeries, um, in my body because of it. So diaphragmatic breathing or also has been known as box breathing. Some people might have heard it that way. You breathe in for a count of four, you hold for a count of four and breathe out for a count of eight. One of my favorite is I do, I like staircase breathing where you breathe in for one, breathe out for one, breathe in for two, breathe out for two, breathe in for three, breathe out for three. Um, I do that a lot if I'm just, I'm kind of wound up because um, I, you know, I got, you know, got home and it's 11 o'clock at night. I've just done the delivery and I'm, I'm keyed. That's a really great way that I bring myself back down. Sleep. Sleep's so, so, so important. And really, we suck. Some people are really great at it, but most, as a American culture, we're terrible. 
Um, like we are really, really terrible. We go to bed willy nilly. We wake up willy nilly. Um, we have the TV on. We have our, we're checking our emails. We're arguing with our, you know, boss on, you know, email at 10 o'clock at night after two glasses of wine. So you want to start winding down one or two hours. When I was doing my master's program, I did zero homework after seven o'clock. Not one stitch of homework did I do after seven o'clock. I would get up at four o'clock in the morning, do my homework, but I would not do it after seven o'clock. Um, sleeping in a dark, comfortable room. I literally have an eye mask and it changed my world because when I moved out, I live out outside of the city, but for some reason my room is so bright and my husband like likes it that way um, because he wants to get up when the sun comes up. And so I wear my eye mask and I'm a much happier person. It's a great marriage compromise. Um, you wanna shoot for eight hours of sleep a night. You wanna avoid caffeine after 2 p.m., especially if you're sensitive, you wanna avoid it after noon. You wanna avoid alcohol within three hours of going to bed. Some people really need to avoid it altogether. You wanna not eat within about three hours of going to bed. You wanna drink, avoid drinking because the number of us who have to get up and pee in the middle of the night, like as we have more birthdays, that comes more common. And then really trying not to do aerobic exercise after 6 p.m. or three hours before bedtime. So many people go after work and exercise, but what it does is it creates a cortisol spike. Um, if you're doing yoga, that's a little bit different, but I'm talking aerobic exercise. Um, I'm talking about going to the gym and doing a major cardio class or going for a long run. Bedroom, like people don't think about this. Ask yourself these things. Is your bed comfortable? Like you spend, you know, one third of your day in your bed. Like, is it comfortable? Are your sheets comfortable? Is your pillow comfortable? Do you have the right number of pillows? I have probably four, um, which I need. What are your pillows set up for whether you can sleep or not? Are you, are you allergic to something in your bed? Uh, I cannot be anywhere near a feather pillow or I cannot sleep. So ask, and some of these questions seem dumb, but part of the problem is beds are expensive and all of the things that go with beds are expensive. And so sometimes we short ourselves. We shouldn't short ourselves here. Um, is your bedroom dark? And, and again, one of my, one of my friends uh, was previewing these slides for me a couple of years ago. And because um, I have a whole lecture on sleep that I give. And she was like, oh my gosh, my bedroom's too bright. <laughs> she was like, I figured it out. I got an eye mask. I'm sleeping great now. Um, is it the right temperature? We need to sleep cooler um, most of the times. Do you need cooling sheets? Um, is your bedroom quiet? Do you need earplugs? Does your partner snore? Um, all of those kinds of things. Um, you want to also avoid stress. So don't argue with your family right before going to bed. You know, a lot of, a lot of it's the news, Facebook, emails, paying bills, checking financial accounts. Like, let's avoid that. You really want to avoid devices. Um, if you are gonna use devices after 7 p.m., if you use amber glasses or put blue light filters on your phone, Apple and Microsoft both have shifts that you can do to reduce the blue light setting. Um, journaling, if you're somebody who wakes up and you've got 13 things on your brain, have some paper beside your bed. Um, write, down, write down your to-do list. Um, write down your to-do list, period, so that you're not checking them off in your head. Check them off on paper, take them out of your brain. All right, I think I got through. I was hoping to have a little more time for questions, so uh, sorry about that. No, that was wonderful. And I, I did answer some of the questions that I thought maybe were a little bit less in depth. So I think we should have plenty of time. Awesome. So the first question we have here was, um, so is the intermittent fasting craze crazy? And that was in response to your breakfast skipping. And I pointed out that, you know, you're talking a little bit about the time that you're eating so much about fasting, but I didn't know if you wanted to speak to fasting. I would love to speak to fasting. So I think people who skip breakfast because it's easier in intermittent fasting are losing out. So if you look at the data, you will do better if you're gonna intermittent fast skipping dinner or eating dinner earlier. So what I'm seeing is a lot of people who, oh, it's way easy for me to skip breakfast because I'm just not hungry. Mm -mm. We use the, we need the bulk of our calories by 2 p.m., okay? Now, if you're a swing shift worker, that's a different ballpark. You need to modify based on when you're really working. But most of us, your, your swing shift three hours, four hour, three or four days, and then you swing back to normal. If you stay on swing shift, which is what I did when I worked, when I had swing shift rotations, I just stayed on it. Then you adjust everything forward. Breakfast is important. We need to eat breakfast. We need to have protein with our breakfast. The American diet is terrible with breakfast. 
We really need more um, protein. And then what I tell people is, ideally what I'd like is breakfast to look like lunch, like be a bigger meal, lunch to be our traditional dinner, and dinner to be like our lightest meal, like what breakfast traditionally is, but with more protein and food. Most people don't wanna skip dinner because that's the meal they're eating with their families. And so my answer is great, bring it to five o'clock, bring it lighter, eat with your family. Or, you know, I had one mom who was eating at eight or nine o'clock at night to eat with her husband because that was their quiet time. And I was like, you need to eat with your kids when they're eating at 5.30. So they pulled their entire family routine to eating with the kids. And then they came up with something else to do to be able to have that couple time. So I don't think the fasting intermittent is, is crazy, but I do think it's really important to look at where you're getting your calories um, and what you're doing. Like my dad does it and he eats whatever he wants during those six hours. That's not great either. So um, it's, it's everything with, with, a, with some balance. So two kind of related questions um, around diet. One is uh, what about natural zero calorie sweeteners like stevia? And another one is what about chewing gum when you're hungry to avoid eating? So I think chewing gum, you have to be careful. A lot of the chewing gum has, uh, what do they have in it? Xylitol. So uh -huh. you've got some stuff um, in it, which is also a natural sugar. Um, I think, I think it can be helpful, but the other question is to check in. Why are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Um, most of us are not getting enough liquid. So instead of chewing gum, could you drink something? Um, could, uh, where are you in your water intake? Um, with the zero calorie sweeteners, I think you have to kind of watch how they're affecting you. Um, are you somebody who has it and then has six of them? Or are you somebody who like, that's just the perfect? Yes, if I'm picking, and again, those are not artificial. Those are natural sweeteners. So those are in a slightly different category. Um, when I was talking about the artificial sweeteners, it really is the artificial one. So your stevia and your xylitol are in a little bit better shape. But one of the things that I tell people is, are you hungry because you haven't had enough protein? Are you hungry because you're actually thirsty? And then a lot of your cravings are because you're missing something. So for instance, chocolate often is you need magnesium. So if you're somebody who's, oh my gosh, I need tons of chocolate, maybe you need some magnesium. Um, if you're really craving salt, sometimes that's a dehydration. Like I haven't had enough water through the day. So really be checking in with yourself on what am I actually feeling? So the next one, there's a, a number of questions about um, sex steroid replacement. Yep. Topical, how do you find a doctor? What's the right way to do it? Um, why should you be doing it or not? Perfect. Love this question. It's one of my favorites. I talk about it all day, every day. One of my favorite, favorite books for people to look at is Estrogen Matters. So Estrogen Matters really took a look at the hormone studies and really said, all right, let's, let me, I'll give you my, my elevator speech. So here's my elevator speech on hormones. The original Women's Health Initiative trial, the question of that trial was, should you give asymptomatic women who are greater than 10 years past menopause hormones for heart disease prevention? Because we used to do that. Like that was an actual clinical practice. The answer to that question is no. You should not give asymptomatic women who are 10 years past menopause hormones for heart disease prevention. That's a no. But there have been multiple, multiple, multiple studies since then. When we start hormones matters, okay? So there was something called the timing hypothesis. Time, when we start hormones matters. The second thing is what we take for estrogen also matters. If you look at most of the data, the data really argues toward transdermal and there's a lot of commercially available. My practice is all commercial. My patients all have health insurance and I want to access their health insurance because they've paid good money for it. So I tend to do commercial things um, and I move into the compounding realm when I can't get something covered or I can't get it to have the effect I want. Transdermal estrogen and then I do oral progesterone. There, um, there are no safety studies looking at transdermal progesterone. There are some, there's one commercial available patch, but it has norethindrone in it, which is in synthetic. I'm not a huge fan of synthetic progesterones. If you look at the WHI and pull it apart, the women who had no uterus, who were started on hormones 10 years past menopause, 50% of them were smokers, um, had a higher, had a lower breast cancer rate. So women on estrogen only actually had a lower breast cancer rate. So that led to the questions on, should we really be focusing on 
estrogen alone, or do we need to look at the combination? And my argument is um, look at the combination. The combination is really, really important. Um, and so I tend to dose people with an estradiol patch because that's the first line that insurance wants. And then I give them oral progesterone. Places to look, you can go to NAMS, the North American Menopause Society, uh, put in um, your zip code and you can find a practitioner. Most of them are more versed and have actually chosen to do menopause. Um, you can also look at um, ifm.com, which is the Institute of Functional Medicine, um, and put in your zip code and that you can find a functional medicine practitioner. Um, I find that a lot, and, and part of it is trust your instincts. I fix people's hormone mistakes all day, every day. I lecture on hormone mistakes. I have a whole case series that I show of hormone mistakes, including my own, um, because you, if you haven't done hormones and you haven't looked at them from 16 different directions. There is a, there's a particular individual who lectures on hormones and teaches physicians and he doses way high and he's arguing that the literature supports him. I went to one of his lectures when he referred to his wife and business partner of 35 years as the B word for the third time, I stepped up and walked out of the room. Like I couldn't do it. I actually pulled the studies he was quoting and what he was saying was not actually true. So it's hard because we're being bombarded. Like I studied, I think at this point in time, I'm, I've looked at five different directions on hormones. I've taken the pieces out that I can back in the literature and, and that I can prove clinically. But I tell my patients all the time, the only reason I'm good at hormones is because I've made my X number of mistakes. Anyone who hasn't made those number of mistakes are going to continue to make them. Um, and one of the mistakes I see is people starting people on too high a hormone. Um, because as I've shown, people in, especially in perimenopause, will have this giant spike. I had one patient up at a thousand. Her estradiol level was a thousand. So Typically on a day three, we're looking at 50, we're looking at 60. Um, somewhere in the cycle, you know, mid luteal, you know, you may be at 300, but a thousand is like pregnancy hormone level. And she was irritable, anxious, like she was miserable. And that's, is she somebody I should have started on, um, on hormones? No, I checked her. So a lot of the things you really have to watch for is hormones is a cash business too. There are a lot of people, the pellet clinics that are making a ton of money on hormones. I like NAMS because if you're looking for somebody who's a little more balanced and I love women's health nurse practitioners, women health nurse practitioners are phenomenal. And the ones that have really decided to dive into hormones, I find that they're conservative, but they're thoughtful. And it's a really great group to look at. Um, I find that in traditional training of OBGYNs, our training stunk. That was the first thing I did when I came out of residency was I got additional training in vulvar vaginal dermatology and menopause because I knew I didn't know enough to take care of the women who trusted me with their care. So I became better. And it's hard because in order to be better, you have to go to all of these extra training. And it's one of the reasons I've continued to educate myself and then get to, to have these kind of things. Like I want people to know what they need to know um, and be able to advocate for themselves, but also to know when they see a charlatan. And there are plenty of charlatans out there. So um, yes, the $500 monthly fee, like I've seen that. Um, the guy that lectures, he charges $800 to do a hormone consultation. And then he does all the labs in house, which he gets charged for. And then he has to deal with the pharmacy. So um, he makes a ton of money. And so you have to look at where people's motives are. Um, so it's, it's really um, important to look at people who are balanced. Um, I also think, um, oh my gosh. Uh, oh, the wonderful woman. Um, she's got the hormone balance. She's an OBGYN. She's out of, I think, I think Lee, you know her. She's- Pamela um, Smith? No, it's the one who's uh, she's starting to lecture with Andy Moore. Um, Oh my gosh, she wrote the- Oh, Zahar Swedon. No, not Sodar. The um, She's an OBGYN. Too many good people. Yes, so many good people. She's a, she wrote the hormone cure. Um, she's in her like mid fifties. Um, oh my gosh, she's amazing. So she's got a bunch of stuff. Oh, Sarah Gottfried. Yeah, Sarah Gottfried. Yes. There we go. I'm like, I can see her face. Um, Sarah Godfrey has got a lot of really good stuff on- um, especially in the perimenopause, the hormone years, 
on how to do things with diet and exercise and balance. So that's another really good one. But if you really want to know about, and so when should you do hormones? It's a personal decision. I'm planning on doing them for once I cross that threshold for the rest of my life. Women in my family do menopause terribly, which is why I dug in. I watched my grandmother having a massive heart attack, bursting into flames with wet hair because they took her off her hormones um, because they blamed her hormones for her heart attack, not her 40 pack year history. So we kind of ignored her smoking and went after her hormones. So she like lived five more years on hormones, status post a heart attack that they gave her three, six months to live from. So hormones are not always the devil. It's, it's looking at doing them correctly and the, a lot of the conservative practitioners who are trained by uh, the American College of Obstetrics Gynecology will say the sh- lowest dose for the shortest amount of time. I disagree with that because that is not based in literature. That was based in, we don't know what to do. So we're gonna make this recommendation because we need to do something with the WHI trial. And there's been so much more that's come out lately. And so you got to take care of the person who's in front of you and deal with what it is that they need. I uh, wanted to just chime in uh, again. Um, first off, uh, just Dr. Williams. Uh, hi, uh, Lorenzo Norris, uh, Director of Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. I, I could, I honestly feel like I could just listen to you speak all day long. I mean, literally, I am. Thank you so very much. I just wanted to just briefly, because I know we're uh, at this point, please, all who can stay, please stay. And if you all want to hear more from Dr. Williams or of this, please attend more of the lectures. But please, feedback, feedback, feedback. So I, I want to acknowledge the very incredible, tremendous work of Dr. Lee Frame, uh, our Associate Director, uh, Ms. Victoria Karacheva, our Behavioral Health Director, our uh, Administrative Director, Ms. Janet Rodriguez. And also, I want to clearly acknowledge uh, the work that our our well-being champion, Dr. Lisa Catapano, uh, head of the five trimesters clinic, we have to jump off, put in. Um, I want to acknowledge this community for coming here and supporting uh, this lecture. And I felt so it was uh, absolutely superb. I want to acknowledge Dr. Williams for absolutely giving us a fabulous, 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 incredible lecture. And absolutely, I wish to acknowledge my colleague whose uh, generous donations and contributions help put this lecture and a series of lectures together and hopefully will go a long way in terms of how we transform the culture in overall for resiliency and well-being, but particularly in terms of women, women's health. And that's Dr. Bose. So uh, Rosemary, boom. Thank you so, 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 so uh, very much um, for everything. This is much, uh, this is a phenomenal. I mean, I, that, it's, it's honestly better than what I, I ever had hoped for. So uh, Dr. Bose, thank you so, so, so much for your generosity. And, and uh, Dr. Williams, thank you so, so very much for being our inaugural lecture. I mean, I literally, my team knows me. I could just sit down with you all day. I'm about to fly. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm head, we're headed out there. We're, there. There's good things going on. Let's do it. <laughs> so, but I turn it back over to the very, 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 very relevant questions. I hope everybody got a lot out of this. I see a number of different colleagues here. I want to say I saw Ms. Sessions here. I saw a lot of people. I see, uh, 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 that, I, saw, I see a lot of folks here. Too many, I'm going to miss some people. But I want to say this, is that, that might be, but in any event, please, more questions. If you want more, give us the feedback and so that we can get more lectures. All right, now I will be quiet. If you have time for one more question, Larry, there's one that I, I think is really important. Um, yep. Again, about how to find a practitioner. Yep. So they, they searched on NAMS as you recommended, which is a great yeah. place to start, but they're saying it's a large list. So do people take interviews? What about insurance covering the visits? So insurance should cover the visits. So insurance should cover the visit. Um, and so I, what I tend to do is go to people's websites. So look at the list and then kind of figure out like, is this somebody who's kind of dabbling in this? Is this somebody who's really taking care of them? Um, is this like, what's their practice like? Um, and it's reasonable to expect insurance to cover it. Insurance should cover this. Um, so, th- you know, that is, um, that is definitely really important. There, there are a couple things I wanted to mention. So one, to taking progesterone is to protect the uterus from cancer. I'll, I'm sorry, I didn't clarify that. So if you take unopposed estrogen, it can cause endometrial cancer. And there are plenty of cases where I'm seeing that. Um, I actually have a case where somebody was taking vaginal hormones at the systemic dosing and gave herself endometrial cancer. So, um, and then I saw two other things. The one to 3 p.m. energy lull, 
I love maca. I am not going to lie. I'm a huge maca fan. Um, they make a company called Symphony makes three types of maca. Um, they make one for people in their hormonal range, one in the perimenopausal range, and one in the menopausal range. And I, I, I use that product all day, every day. Um, and then one of the other things, um, so supplements for hot flashes, uh, Vitanica, which was created by a naturopath in my community, Tori Hudson has got some really great, uh, her phase two is really good. Um, a lot of times with, with continuing hot flashes, it's what's going on with blood sugar. So I can't emphasize the importance in our, in our community for uh, blood sugar. Um, again, heart disease and women, I think we do not know as much as we need to know about our blood sugar. So I, I'd love if everyone walks out today is know what your blood sugar numbers are, know what your hemoglobin A1C is, know what your insulin is, know if this is an issue that you have. If it's an issue you have, you got to tackle it. And there are some really great diet and lifestyle changes that can happen, but you, you got to do something. Um, one of the questions was, is metformin a preventative med? Yes, metformin can be a preventative med. Um, I use a lot of berberine as well, um, but they don't work in isolation. Metformin, I call, I tell it's the biggest call out. If you take metformin and you get diarrhea and nausea, you're eating too many carbs. Like I can call it out 100% of the time. If I've got a patient that I put metformin and she comes in and she says, oh, I can't do this, I'm super nauseous. I'm like, you're eating terribly. Like, you're right. Like, you're not tell you're not eating what you're telling me you're eating. It's it's it'll call people out faster than anything else. I got my it is the great lie detector. And so we then go after like, all right, what are you actually eating? And a lot of times they're skipping meals, and you can't skip meals in that form. You have to eat. Um, those are the three that I saw that I wanted to um, hit. I didn't know if there was other ones. Great point. I'm really glad you mentioned berberine too, because both berberine and metformin act on the gut microbiome in pretty much the exact same way. So if perhaps you don't want to try metformin for whatever reason, perhaps berberine might be a good introductory method. Yes. Berberine. I, I love berberine. And um, if you're having diarrhea with berberine, one of the great dosing tricks I do is I have people take it at bedtime, skip that morning dose, and you can usually get the diarrhea to calm down because sometimes it'll do the same way that... Um, or not even diarrhea, it's, it's loose stools, but that's the trick is take it at bedtime. Oh, B-E-R-B-E. -E -E. oh, I yeah. just put it in the chat. <laughs> better than I am. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N, bare brain. Yes, and I'm, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Again, this women's health is my love. Like I got lucky to have fallen into a career that I absolutely love and I love integrative women's health. The most. So, and I'm grateful to my education at GW because I think it helped me get the credentials behind my name to move forward um, and hopefully get to continue to change medicine for the better. Um, we couldn't end on a better note than that. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, judging by the number of questions, I think we might have to have you back. <laughs> I would love to come back. I'm actually trying to 